wholeheartedly um, carry out that instruction to the best of our ability. But at the time, no one could know what the Secretary of State's real policy was. A memo drafted during the strike by Merlin Rees, declassified for this program, reveals that despite pledges of support, the government were content to see the executive fall. While the Northern Ireland executive remains in being, there can be no real movement. But the situation changes once they go. And then typed over. Either by resignation or by being sacked. He continued, Nor do we want any of the present executive to stay. It would be a quite unnecessary provocation to the strikers to keep any or all of the unionists. Well, that, that new memo and, and material would seem to underline the fact that they want it, which is astonishing. The administration, the, the, the Sunningdale administration, the power sharing administration to come down. They, they simply stood aside uh, and, and allowed the Ulster Workers Council strike run by paramilitary organisations to succeed. Sunningdale had been well, it was a triumph for Ted Heath and Francis Prim, a, a triumph on paper. The plain fact was that we'd gone up the wrong alley with Sunningdale. And I suppose really at the back of my mind, sitting on the edge of my bed at night, or lying in bed and thinking, once the Sunningdale agreement, once the power sharing executive broke, the cycle had finished. As this holiday weekend begins, Northern Ireland faces the gravest crisis in her history. That night, those lucky enough to have electricity gathered around the television to hear the Prime Minister. Most expected action. The strike leaders thought the army were about to swoop. But Harold Wilson surprised almost everyone. And yet people who benefit from all this now viciously defy Westminster, purporting to act as though they were an elected government. People who spend their lives sponging on Westminster and British democracy. Spongers. 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 And he called us all spongers. Who do these people think they are? I sat with my wife in horror. If there was anything designed to harden the Unionist strikers at that time, it was Harold Wilson calling them spongers. At that stage, I just turned to my wife and I said, you know, I'm afraid. Love, the power sharing executive experiment is over. I will gladly invest him with a new badge of honor. The sponge became a symbol of defiance. Wilson's comment had alienated the crucial middle ground. His failure to order tough action left the executive twisting in the wind. Once Harold Wilson made his speech, it didn't really matter much what happened, it was all finished. On Monday morning, troops did finally make some limited moves, taking over a few petrol stations. But it was too little, too late. The strikers simply reacted by upping the pressure. The army have come in to break a strike, and the responsibility for the essential services is now <coughs> entirely there. Farmers coming out and coming out in such force, that was really the grand finale. It was something to watch. There was tractors and there was machinery of every description up at Stormont. I was the person involved that supplied the three donkeys, and the donkeys were called Brian, Jerry and Paddy. I was standing on one of the balconies. I remember Ross and Curry saying, hey, actually, that's the unionist population turning against their political masters. There was the Council of Ireland Act that we were not going to wear, and it was just as simple as that. I remember about this, he said, this, this is a historic occasion. I said, it would be more historic if some of them were able to climb up this, these rafters and get the hold of you and me. I remember Faulkner had sent for me. You know, I had to pass on to him this fairly despairing situation about, you know, the reality of life in Northern Ireland. If, if the strike went on, you know, the possibility of, you know, sewage coming bubbling up into the streets and so on. With thousands of protesters outside, the executive met for the last time. Brian Faulkner believed the talks with the strikers were now the only way out and went to see the Secretary of State. Erwin Rees said that uh, he couldn't agree uh, to any kind of accommodation with the strikers. And, uh, you know, Faulkner then said, well, you know, in that case, I, I resign. It's a sad situation. 
I have never experienced a sadder day in my life from the point of view of the country that I love. It was all sort of very emotional, so it was, you know. And I said to Brian, I said, well, you didn't get me on the apple juice, you know, and this is no day to be thinking about apple juice. And then we all shook hands. I said to Brian, well, Brian, at least we tried. It was, a, it was well worth trying, but uh, things will never be the same again. The streets in large areas of Belfast were just full of people. The Belfast Telegraph came out with a heading, a headline, a big massive banner headline, and I remember people just carrying the paper up and down the street, which was very much like uh, the VE days in London. I remember parades of elderly pensioners on the Newton Arts Show just marching up and down with sheer glee carrying Union Jacks, just loving every minute of it. I said, what the hell am I going to do with myself now? And all, all of a sudden, we were going to have to give all this up. I was reluctant to have given it up. Well, this is Barry Cowan in Belfast, and the big news of this morning is that the Ulster Workers' Council have called off the strike and recommended a phased return to work. After a day of argument, the UWC voted to end their strike. Their main demand for fresh elections had not been met. But the politicians on the Workers' Council were content to see their rivals on the executive defeated. They now distanced themselves from the paramilitaries. With surprising speed, both the power supplies and unionist politics returned to normal. When we returned to work, that was being asked on the shop floor, what did we get out of this? It was such a strange thing to have happened that all of a sudden that we were able to make the government listen to what the people on the street had to say, and then all of a sudden it was no big deal. But that fortnight of fear, anger and frustration did have a lasting impact. An elected government had been brought down in a virtual coup, and the powers at Westminster had been content to see that happen. On the night the strike ended, Harold Wilson confided to an opposition leader that the Cabinet's view all along had been that we should sit it out during the strike. Sunningdale and uh, uh, power sharing, which was set up by the previous administration, was a magnificent concept which I supported. Power sharing was the right thing to attempt and power sharing will in the end be the way out of this problem. The Wilson government set a deadline of four months to work out a deal restoring devolved government to Northern Ireland. 30 years on, that deal is still proving hard to strike. I was devastated, absolutely devastated because I knew it'll be another generation before an experiment like this will be tried again. They regarded the executive that we had formed as being by far and away the most important thing that ever happened to Northern Ireland. If we had stopped with the formation of the executive and then took the Council of Ireland gradually in instalments that the Unionists would have been able to take. But it was just too much for the Unionists. I still think it was a noble experiment and that a lot of people now dead would be alive if it had worked.